I just want to say I'm really going to miss you. I just want you to know that. Man, thank you for leading us in worship, bud. Whew. Well, it is July 1st. And every year around this time, we hit the beginning of July. And our hearts are just filled with nationalistic pride. And we get ready to celebrate. And we get ready to wave the banner. So let me be one of the first ones to say to you today, happy Canadian Independence Day. That's right. July 1st is Canadian Independence Day. And so all our Canadian friends watching by live stream, we just want to say thanks for being a good neighbor. You're so very polite, all right? Now we get ready that in the middle of this week, we get to celebrate our own Independence Day, our American Independence Day on Wednesday, July 4th. 242 years old this year is America. And we celebrate in lots of different ways. You, you go out and you, some will thank veterans and thank them for their service that we've done so this morning. Some will go out and they'll grill, hopefully get a chance to take a day off of work. Some folks will hit the July 4th day sales. Some folks will go out and they will uh, hang a flag or they'll dress in red, white, and blue. But there is one thing that is synonymous with July 4th, and that is fireworks, right? I've been waiting 364 days for the fireworks. And I don't know, and we moved here to Alabama, that you can't just go and buy fireworks around our neck of the woods. You have to wait for the stores to open and then go. And so we get excited about going and walking through the aisles there, bringing the kids with us. And they always want the one that's called the big one. And I'm like, well, I'd like to send you to college one day. We can't afford the big one, okay? So instead, we end up one of those little multi-packs and we get it out there, and we always have what we like to call our pre-show there in the driveway. We'll wait till it gets a little dusk outside, starts getting a little dim, and we'll line it up, and we'll do the pre-show. We'll start with the smallest ones and move to the biggest ones. We start with the snaps. You remember the snaps? The little white things you used to throw at your brother and sister, make the little pop sound. Remember those, right? We'll start with those. And then we'll move on to some sparklers and then some of those bottle caps. And then we'll have the fountain ones, you know, the ones that kind of spew up those beautiful different colors right there. And inevitably, we always buy one that has that ear-splitting sound. You know what I'm talking about? You light it off and all of a sudden it's like, and it just makes that loud noise there. which makes our kids squeal with delight or terror, one of the two, right? And we light all those off, we have a big time, and then it's time for the main event. We load everybody up into the van, and we go someplace to watch the fireworks. And you get there, and you get your seats, and you get out there, and you have to wait until it's nice and dark outside. And then you see that first little tail of light, and then a giant boom of red, and boom of blue, and boom of green, right? And you see those beautiful fireworks and millions of people all across our country will go and watch that because there's something so striking about seeing a burst of light across a dark night sky. And the thought occurred to me today or this week as I was preparing for this message today that that is a picture of America. That there's a lot of darkness in America today and we are in need of light. There is an increasing amount of darkness that seems to get across through news waves and social media, and we see it every single day. Escalating violence in our schools, racism in our communities, divisiveness run rampant, and there's just a lot of darkness around us. One evidence of that is that we, we look sometimes and we realize that the flag is at half-mast a lot more often than it seems like it used to be. Am I right? We see that we are having to grieve one national tragedy after another. We are in a nation in the midst of an identity crisis. And in the midst of that, in the midst of that darkness, what we need is light. We need a burst of light. And Jesus calls us to be that. There's a passage of scripture that Pastor Danny talks about often in Discover Shades. If you've been around here for any length of time, you've heard it. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. These are Jesus' words when he says to us, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
And as believers, we are called to be light in the midst of darkness. But we also notice something else as believers. That as we look and kind of see the culture around us, it seems like increasingly the culture's going this way, and following Jesus according to his word requires us to go this way. That the culture is calling us to go this way, that the gravitational pull and the gravity is going this way with our culture, but following Jesus often means going this way. What are we to do with that tension? What are we to do with that conflict? How do we respond to it, and how do we choose this moment to be light? In fact, what does it even mean to be light? Well, the scriptures speak to us often about what it means to be citizens in the midst of a culture that may not necessarily always align with our values or what scripture teaches us. Jeremiah 29, Romans chapter 13, Philippians chapter 3. But today, I want to take us to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting off of verse 9, is where we're going to be at today. And let me just say this, a quick pause before we kind of jump in there as you're finding it in your Bible or on your Bible apps there. That if you're here today, and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus, and maybe in your mind you have an idea based upon cable news or some other outlet about what Christians are supposed to do with government, and you've seen different things out there, you may have an opinion already. And I would just encourage you today to listen with an open heart, an open mind, to what the scriptures teach us, to what the scriptures say about being citizens. And hopefully you might see God's heartbeat for you and for his people and for this country as well. But also I would just say to us as believers that this passage of scripture is really written directly to us. What Peter's doing is he's writing to a group of believers, churches, that find themselves under persecution in an area of the Roman Empire. And at best, the culture was indifferent to Christianity. And at worst, it was openly hostile towards Christians and the teachings of Christ. This was a government that Peter is writing to, people that are under a government that didn't consider Christian values in the least. It was a tense time, rising persecution, and the culture of the empire is definitely not in line with Scripture. And it's into this space that Peter chooses to speak to us to help us to understand how do we respond to that tension in the culture. How do we respond as believers seeking to carry the light? How do we live as believers at that moment in time when we feel that kind of tension? Now the first thing he's going to do, before he gives us some real practical action steps, and there's going to be lots of those today, he gives us a really foundational truth that all believers in Jesus have to understand and embrace in order for us to have this kind of impact and influence on culture and on our country. And that foundational truth is found, for starting off here in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the point that he's trying to drive home for us is the first point in the message today, that we are citizens of another kingdom. We are citizens of another kingdom. He says, you are a chosen race, but that's not because of our skin color or because of a certain ethnic group that we belong to. He says, you are a royal priesthood, but that's not because we've been ordained or have a certain religious background. He says that you are a people, a holy nation. But that's not because we belong to some geopolitical country. What he's saying is that you belong to these things. You are a people of my possession. Because once you were in darkness, and what I did by my grace, by my mercy, through the cross, through the resurrection, is I called you out of that darkness into the light. And not only did I call you into the light, but I called you in to proclaim me. To proclaim the light and to reflect it to the world around you. He says that in verse 10, that once you were not a people. The point that he's driving home here is that no one starts in God's kingdom. It's a choice that we have to make to join his kingdom. Nobody is born into it. No one gets to it because of their family tree or their country's creed, that it has to be a decision that we make. And that at that point at which we choose to embrace God's mercy, at that point, when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior, then we also make him our king. Now I want you to notice In verse 9, it says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then I want you to see in verse 10, it says, You were not a people, but now you 
are God's people, that this is a fact of our faith, that we have a king, that we are citizens of another kingdom at the point at which we ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. So what is God's kingdom, and what does that mean? I like how Al Mohler defines it. He's a seminary president, theologian, scholar. He puts it this way, that God's kingdom is essentially his reign over his people for their good and his glory. That God rules in our hearts in such a way that it means our good and his glory for those around us. Philippians 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are citizens of another kingdom. Now, because we're citizens of another kingdom, does that mean that we can't honor and celebrate our country? Does that mean that we can't honor and celebrate our heritage? Well, no. No, God, in fact, has placed us here in the midst of this country to live within it and to represent his kingdom. As I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded about July 4th and our own family history. July 4th, 1952 is an important date for our family because on July 4th, 1952, my grandfather, Sergeant First Class Charles Reedy, Chuck, came home. He had fought in World War II on the Pacific Theater. And then he had been part of the force that occupied Japan from 1945, the the war's end, to 1952. On July 4th, he finally came home aboard the USS H.B. Freeman. In fact, I think we've got a picture of that ship right there. July 4th, that's the ship that my grandfather came came home in. He didn't just come home alone. While he was in Japan, he met a nice young lady, a Japanese citizen. Her name was Taiko. They fell in love. They got married. They had their first baby and started a family. And aboard that ship came my grandmother, my grandfather, and my Uncle Doug, July 4th, coming to this country. Within a year, my mother was born. And it was around about that time that my grandmother became very ill, down and depressed. I took her to some military doctors. They couldn't quite figure out what was going wrong with her. And so my grandfather scraped together their meager savings and got her in to see a civilian doctor. And that civilian doctor talked with her a little bit and very quickly discovered that her issue was that she felt like she was not at home. That she felt like she wasn't really connecting with her new surroundings. And what he said to her is that you need to help her become a citizen. Well, that set my grandmother with a purpose and a passion And so she studied the language and got more and more proficient in it. Then she studied America and got more and more grounded in what it is to be an American. And in 1960, my grandmother became a U.S. citizen. In fact, this is her certificate of naturalization right there. 1960, that's my grandmother right there. Now, if you were to go find my grandmother and you were to sit down with her, she would go on and on about Japanese heritage, culture, where she came from, and she could tell you all about it. She still speaks the language fluently. I remember growing up, and I remember seeing it all around the house. Some of y'all, your grandmother's home cooking was like chicken and dumplings. Mine was sushi, okay? Like she loved her heritage, loved it. But if you were to sit with her and ask her, but where are you a citizen? No mention of Japan would cross her lips. What she would say is she would say, I am an American. For nearly 60 years now, she has been an American citizen. And for us, we don't say that we don't like our American heritage or history. We don't say that we don't stand upon it. It's not something that we lock up in a closet because now we're followers of Jesus and citizens of a kingdom. We honor our heritage. We honor where we come from. But we know that our allegiance is first and foremost to our king. And at which point there is ever a decision to be made between our country going in this direction and our kingdom going this direction, we choose our king and his kingdom every single time because we are citizens, ultimately, of another kingdom, an eternal kingdom, God's kingdom. We are citizens of another kingdom. And now what Peter is going to do, now that he's given us this foundational truth, is he's going to give us some practical action steps for what it looks like to be light, for how to respond and interact with the culture. And so he's going to give it to us in the form of these next several verses. Verse 11 says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Here's the second point, that we have to prepare 
for a personal battle. We have to prepare for a personal battle. Notice what he says here, that he calls them sojourners and exiles. And what's interesting about that is the people he's writing to, for the most part, are not sojourners and exiles, literally. They're not refugees. They haven't been pulled out of their home country. They're living where they've always lived, residing where they've always resided. So why is he calling them sojourners and exiles? He's saying that because now, with the realization that they are now a part of God's kingdom, there are times in which they feel like outsiders. Times in which they feel like they can't connect with the values of their country and their culture because they are connected with kingdom values, with the values that God calls us to be about in his work. And he warns us that with a shifting culture, temptation can be on the rise. That we have to be ready for that. That we shouldn't be like the culture that surrounds us, but the Jesus that is within us. Make no mistake that there is an enemy that seeks to draw in people, individuals, from God's kingdom, and to tear them down brick by brick through temptation. That happens. But it's kind of subtle in the way it happens. Especially in our own culture right now, oftentimes you won't see people that will come to you and say, you need to take this book, take God's word, and disbelieve all of it and go in a different direction of the culture. Very rarely will you see people that will say, you need to just renounce your faith and go in a different direction in culture. But more often than not, people will say things like, no, you're free to believe what's written in this book, but maybe not all of it. Maybe there are some sections that are not relevant anymore. Maybe there are some sections that we shouldn't have to stand by anymore. Maybe there are some things that you should not hold so fast to from God's Word. It reminded me of Thomas Jefferson's Bible. I don't know if you are familiar with the story. Many of our founding fathers were strong believers, but not all of them. And Thomas Jefferson was one of those that was not a strong believer. In fact, when he ran for president in the year 1800, he was branded by his critics as a howling atheist, somebody that doesn't believe in God. In fact, he was a deist, somebody that believes that maybe God created things, but now he's far and away, and you can't have a relationship with God. But Thomas Jefferson owned a copy of Scripture. And he used to take his copy of Scripture, and as he would read it, if he came across a passage that he didn't necessarily agree with, you know what he would do? He'd pull out a pen knife, and he would just cut it out. And say, well, I don't agree with that. And he'd just remove it. Don't you wish you could do that sometimes? Like maybe you go to your bank sometime this week and say, hey, can we just look at our loan agreement, and I just want to cut a zero off of that. You know, that just seems like a good decision, right? Pay that off a lot faster now. Don't you wish that when you get pulled over by a police officer, which I know nobody, nobody in this congregation, I'm speaking about other people elsewhere, that when they give you that fine, you're just like, you know what, I'm just going to cut that fine right out of there. No points on the driver's license for me. Insurance is staying the same. Don't you wish you could do that? That's what he would do. Take the truth of God's word and cut it out. And then he would write out his own thoughts. And then he would carefully craft them and paste them into God's word. So by the time he got done with his Bible, which you can see on display in the Smithsonian, it's a little less God's Word and a little bit more Thomas Jefferson's Word. Isn't that a picture of what so many in our culture and even in the church have now become, have now accepted? That we don't stand upon the entirety of God's Word, but we edit it. Billy Graham, speaking a number of years ago, made this observation about America he said, whether you know it or not, we are becoming more and more a secularistic nation. We are becoming a place where man himself is an idol. We are humanizing God, and we are deifying man. So how do we respond? We respond with the heartfelt belief as kingdom citizens that this book and every word within it, we shall stand upon it, that we have no right to edit it because it is God's word and he is the authority. That we prepare for the personal battle by saying that we will adhere to this, come what may, because we believe in God and his word. We will prepare for a personal battle. But not only that, not only kind of a defensive strategy, but now Peter's going to turn us to kind of an offensive strategy of what it means to be like, what it means to respond and to interact with the culture. He makes this observation here in verse 12 that we need to keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable. 
so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Here's the point he's trying to make, that we should overcome evil with good. We should seek to overcome evil with good. The word that he says here for having honorable conduct, that word right there is literally good conduct. And later on he says that we need to do good deeds. He's saying that do good deeds, do good conduct. That's what we are called to do. Then as we go down in verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to the praise of those who do good. And this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now there he says that those who are in authority, they praise those who do good. And later on it says that we should be about doing good. Those two words is the Greek word for doing right, that we choose to do what's good, that we choose to do what's right, that when we are confronted with evil, we choose to do what's right. And the promise of Scripture and the testimony of God's Word here is that when we do that, when that is the way that we represent our King, when that's how we live out our kingdom citizenship, then what happens is that those that see us, they cannot speak evil against us, and they will glorify God. They'll honor Him. It will so impact people that see our good that it will overcome evil. In fact, that's exactly the way that Paul spoke to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, when he was speaking about how we relate to our culture and to our government. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, don't just, def- in other words, don't just defend yourself against the temptations of culture, but demonstrate good to those that are around us. Jesus, in that same passage that I, uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of this message, made this statement in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. So I was thinking about this reality. I was reminded of Daniel. You remember the story of Daniel, right? Daniel and the lion's den, right? But you remember the lead up, how he ended up in that lion's den, right? See, Daniel was a literal exile. He'd been pulled out of what was supposed to be God's nation, the nation of Israel, and he was then put in exile. And while he was there, they were put him in the kingdom's court, and they tried to encourage him to not follow God and his standard. But Daniel would not be moved. He always chose to do what was good, chose to do what is right, chose to do good for his kingdom according to his kingdom values. And so he lived this out. And then pretty soon he gained influence and he gave some, some prestige and he kind of rose through the ranks and he became one of the top guys there in Babylon. Well, his opponents didn't like this very much. They got very jealous. And so they started to try and look for some dirt on Daniel, but they couldn't find any. And so they decided they were going to try and create some, some false accusations. But it was really hard to refute a man of that kind of character who was always doing good and always choosing to do what was right. And so what they ended up doing is they got the king to decree that all the people should only pray to the king. No longer were they allowed to pray to God of any faith. They now had to pray only to the king. What did Daniel do? He saw his country's decree, and he said, that is not in alignment with God's word. I will continue to pray to my God. He was not about to violate his relationship with God. And so they simply followed him back to his house, where he opened up his windows and continued to pray openly to the Lord his God, the one true God. Well, when they did this, they brought him before the king. The king saw him there, and the king tried to work it out, but he knew that he had to enforce the law. And so they took him, and they gave him the penalty of throwing him into that lion's den. They sealed it up that night King Darius, a pagan king, a king that did not believe in God, a king that had called his country to pray to him instead of to God. That king didn't sleep very well. He woke up the next morning, and he went out there, And he said, Daniel, has the Lord your God saved you? And Daniel said, yes. They lifted him up out of the lion's den. And because he chose to do what was right, and because he chose to do what was good, because of this amazing witness of God's faithfulness in his life, King Darius became convinced that he too needed to glorify God. And so he made a decree that we see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 25 through 28. 
Remember, this is a pagan king, a king that did not know God, a king that was convinced because of the witness of Daniel. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, this powerful man sending this message across the globe, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You know what Daniel did? He overcame evil with good. Gained influence And he overcame evil by continually choosing to do what was good and what was right. But Peter is not done yet. He's going to continue coaching us in this. Not only that we need to prepare for a personal battle. Not only do we need to overcome evil with good. But he's going to make another point here for us to learn to relate to our culture. For us to see how we are to be light at this moment in time. Now this next point, I'll be honest with you. When I came across it, it seems a little counterintuitive especially given the cultural environment that we see ourselves in. He tells us that we are to show honor. To show honor. Look what it says here in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to the governors that are sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. That for God's sake we submit ourselves to be subject unto the governing authorities. And then he tells us in verse 17 to kind of wrap this around and summarize the statement. He says that we are to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. That word honor there, it means what you would think it means, yes, to honor, but it also means that we see the value in the person that's standing before us, that we see the value in the people that we are talking with. We see the value in them as human beings created in God's image. He starts off by saying we're supposed to honor everyone, even those that we disagree with. I think that you'd agree with me that we are at a point where we tend to get shrill as a nation. Whenever we disagree with someone, there's not a lot of civility there, and God calls us to be a people who show honor and value others, even those that we wholeheartedly disagree with. Then it says that we are to love the brotherhood, that for us in this room, relating to one another, we are to demonstrate that kind of agape, Christ-like, selfless love where we support and pray for one another as we live in a culture that doesn't always align with our kingdom, that we strive to be light together. Then it says that we fear God. And notice, fear God is the only thing on the list that gets fear. Fear meaning to reverence, to worship, that we worship God and God alone. And then he finishes it by saying, honor the emperor. And what makes that really radical is the emperor he's talking about here, according to most evangelical scholars who've studied this passage, they believe that that emperor was Nero. Nero was a guy that was not a friend of Christians. In fact, within a few years after writing this letter, he would unleash what one commentator called a literal bloodbath among the Christians there in Rome. This was not a guy who aligned with Christian values. This was not a guy that cared about Christian values. This was not a guy who supported Christians in the least. In fact, he would be a guy who would be responsible for the death of many of them. And what does Peter say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God's word is that we're to honor even that guy. We honor the emperor. Like Daniel, we don't necessarily always have to obey anything that is decreed for us that is not in alignment with God's word, but we always show honor. And we could all do better in this. I personally can do better in this. We try and instruct my, our kids in our home how to speak with honor. It's not always the easiest task. Some of you that have young children or have had young children understand what it's like to try and get your children to speak to each other with honor, right? Like if one child inadvertently or very intentionally injures another child, right? 
you make them go talk to them, and you tell them, hey, tell your sister sorry, right? How do they say it? Sorry, right? Dripping with sarcasm, right? And their tone betrays the truth that you're trying to get them to convey. Sometimes our tone betrays the truth that we're trying to convey to a world that needs to know God's truth. A number of years ago, and I was at a different church, we brought a group of students to Washington, D.C. It was a tremendous trip. They got a chance to meet with a lot of people that are working hard in our nation's capital to try and bring a Christian worldview, a Christian policy to the table. And they talked to different folks that were involved in the United States representatives, United States Senate, and they talked to lots of different folks that uh, were involved up in the uh, Supreme Court. It was just an incredible, incredible time. But there was one big figure in, in, in kind of Christian culture who was there. And he shall remain nameless. We had a Q&A time. And there were a couple of young kids who came to the front in front of a, a crowd of about 900 students. They came to the crowd and they got to a microphone and they asked a question. They made a few statements first and then they asked a question. Now those students that made that question were 100% incorrect. They were 100% wrong. I don't know where they got their facts from. They were 100% wrong. But the guy on the platform just hammered them. I mean, he just laid into them. These, these kids that were probably 15, 16, 17 years old, he just nailed them. Now, what the speaker was saying was 100% true. But his tone, his demeanor, well, let's just say this. At the end of that session, there was a break. Everybody emptied out of the room, and we got into the lobby area there. Not a single one of the students that were there were talking about the truth of what the speaker had said. They were talking about the tone in which he said it. And how disappointed they were in that. Is truth more important than tone? Yes. 100%. Yes. Make no mistake about it. The truth is most important. But our tone matters. If we want people to hear us. We have to speak in a way they can hear us. In love, respect, in showing honor, valuing the person that we are speaking to. Peter calls us to show honor. Now, when we do these things, prepare for a personal battle, overcome evil with good, show honor, we start shining the light in some really specific and impactful ways. And these things will lead to influence, influence like Daniel, influence like the early church, influence like Jesus, which is why when you get down here to verse 21, then Peter starts speaking specifically of Jesus. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. Here's the next point, that we need to follow our king's example to see his kingdom expand. That Jesus exemplifies the way we are to go, to follow in his footsteps. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. That, that for Jesus, he always did what was good. He always did what was right. And that caused many people around him to glorify God. He always chose to do what was right, overcoming evil with good. Then in verse 23, And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That even when they came after him and reviled him and threatened him, he did not threaten back. Instead, he showed honor and trusted God. Then in verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his words, you have been healed. That he understood that even if we prepared for our personal battle, even if we prepared against temptation, there would be still times that we'd fall short that we disobey him and dishonor him. And that when we do this, we would need forgiveness, that we would need forgiveness for the penalty for our sins, which is death. So he took our penalty on himself when he went to the cross, that by his wounds we have been healed. When we couldn't win the battle, he won it for us. And in every nation, tribe, 
tongue, and people. God is calling his people to represent him, to proclaim him, so that his kingdom might expand across the ends of the earth. And can I tell you, his strategy worked. Because when Peter writes this to these people living in the Roman Empire, Christianity is just a startup, just a small thing. A few thousand people that are kind of running around, and it was viewed largely as a cult. But they doubled down on being light to their culture. And when they did that and intentionally lived that way, within a couple hundred years, Christianity swept through the Roman Empire and it had completely saturated the culture. And several scores of people trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We follow his example to gain influence for his glory in our culture. And let me make an aside here. Because there's some things that this scripture doesn't hit upon that we have the opportunity to, a unique thing that we have the opportunity to do in our own country that they didn't have the opportunity to do within that period of time. That is that we live in a democracy where we actually as people have a voice in the process. And what I want to just encourage in us is that there are some really productive ways to have influence there as well. One is to enter into leadership, to actually seek elected office. And I thank God for the people in this congregation that have taken their faith, take their beliefs, and they have entered into the fray, and they're trying to stand for God. They need our prayers. In this last election cycle, I talked with a couple of them, and let me just say, their calling is hard. It's extraordinarily difficult. They need our prayers. Another avenue for entering into leadership and actually entering into a great service for our country are those that actually serve in our armed forces. They need our prayers. They are literally on the front lines. We need to do everything that we possibly can to support them being light there in the armed forces. So entering into leadership, becoming a part of that, that is one way that we have the opportunity to serve and to expand our influence. Another way is to vote, that we actually have the opportunity to vote for statutes and for people that we believe kind of represent that. Now, let me just say this. We are a part of a representative government, right? That means that we vote for people to represent us and that there's no necessarily, no one candidate that 100% aligns with everything in God's word, okay? Well, there could be one. In fact, there's some people that have tried to put together an exploratory campaign, but it looks like Jesus is not going to run in 2020. I, I don't know. I just, we'll have to wait and see, right? And no one candidate embodies all of our Christian values, but when you have the opportunity to vote for somebody or vote for something that is representative of your values in large part, then we should take the opportunity to do that. That that is a productive way of influence in our country. There's something that I want to share with you on a personal note for me personally. Like just the part of the reason why I wanted to talk about this today was something that happened in my life see, in my early 20s, I was not heading for the church, right? Uh, when I first met my wife, I wasn't coming to, to be a, a preacher guy or serve as a minister or anything like that. I had my eyes set on something else. I wanted to be a part of, of being in government. I wanted to, to run for office. I wanted to serve in government. I wanted to, to go to my four-year Christian school and then go to Florida State, go Knowles, get my master's, and you know I had to work it in at some point, right? And then get my master's of public administration, and then I was going to go back to my hometown, and then I was going to try and serve in local government, and then I was going to see kind of how far I could go with maybe running for state office at some point. That was my plan, right? Because I just, I believe that that was a great way to affect real change, and it is, and we affirm that. But I had the opportunity to, to go with a, a group of people and to hear a United States representative speak, and I was excited to hear him speak because he was going to talk about his faith in Jesus. And he talked about how he was fighting to get kind of the Christian worldview in policy making. And he was talking about all the different things that they were doing in government to try and stand for Jesus. And then he came to a point in the message, after talking about this for several minutes, he came to a point in the message and he got to the end of it and he just kind of said to us, but can I just tell you something? We're just the rear guard, those of us that are in Washington. That policy will only take us so far. That we have to see revival come from the church and awakening sweep across our land. That policy doesn't necessarily change human hearts. That we need a movement 
of God. That revival comes from the church. I don't know if you captured what Matt Driscoll said earlier in his prayer, but I wrote it down because I just thought, this is so good. If we want to see God's rule in our country, he must first rule in our hearts. So cast our vote, yes, but let's love and honor our neighbor. Raise our voice to, on the issues, yes, but don't forget to proclaim your king. Enter into leadership, but lead people to Jesus. Let us be a people that says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Let's raise up and see the gospel go person to person all across our nation so that they might experience the life-changing relationship with Jesus and experience the joy that is knowing God. Let's be the light. And this Wednesday, if you're one of millions of Americans who sit and watch the fireworks pierce the night sky, as you see it happen, remember, that's our calling, to be light in the midst of darkness, to be those who would constantly and consistently show light for King Jesus. Verse 25, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of our souls. I started this message by talking to a handful of people, maybe more, that are in the room that maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I want you to see that he says here that we were straying like sheep, that every single person, regardless of where you come from, strays from God and from his standard. And we all struggle with this thing called sin, disobeying God. But praise God, for those of us in this room that know Jesus, we have had the opportunity to reconnect with our shepherd the overseers of our soul, to begin a relationship with God because of Jesus, because he went to the cross, because his wounds have healed our sins. That the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life because of his death and resurrection on the cross. And if you're here today, I want to invite you to know the God that loves you so very much that no matter what your background is, what your affiliation is, he is willing to say that he wants you, that he will pay the penalty for your sins. And that can happen right here, right now. We're going to enter into a time of prayer, a brief time of prayer. I'm going to invite everybody to bow our heads and close our eyes here now. We're going to reserve the first of the time here in prayer to talk to folks in this room that may need to begin a relationship with Christ. But we are going to talk to the believers in this room and, and pray a prayer of blessing and ask God to, to move in our hearts and our life to represent him well. Let me first talk to those that need to know Jesus. Let me say this, that you're here today and you are ready to begin that relationship with him. That's actually uh, a pretty simple thing to understand. Not necessarily an easy thing to do, but simple thing to understand. And it comes when you come to God and you say, I surrender. I, I'm done doing things in my own way. I want to do things your way, God. I, I'm ready to yield to you and I need your forgiveness. And you do that, and God will give you a relationship with his heavenly Father. You do that, and then you have a relationship, and you become a part of a kingdom that has no end. So if you're here today, and you're ready to make that decision, I would just invite you silently in your heart to pray a prayer to God, voicing your faith and your trust in him. And let me just say this, it's not about repeating this, the words that I say up here. That's kind of a meaningless thing. It's more about you making these words your own and praying them genuinely to God who is listening. So if you're here and that's you, take a moment and pray this or something like this to God. Call out to God right now and say, I, I know, I know, Jesus, that I am a sinner, that I've disobeyed you. But I also know that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I believe that you rose from the grave and so right here and right now, as best I know how, I surrender myself to you. I turn away from living life my way, and I turn to living life your way. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I give it all to you. You're here today, and you prayed that prayer. And I'm just thrilled for you. Whether you're young, whether you're old, no matter where you're at today, 
angels celebrate the fact that you've just begun that relationship with Jesus. I want to encourage you to do a couple things. One, if you can take that connect card that Danny talked about earlier in the message and earlier in this time of worship, and you can take that and just check off the little box right there that says uh, that today I am committing my life to Christ. You can also come to the front. At the end of this worship service, there'll be some of us here at the beginning and just say, hey, listen, today I made that decision. Consider it an honor, a joy to talk with you about that decision. So when the end of this service comes, you come and talk to us or drop this card in the plate as it goes by there. We won't badger you. We just want to encourage you in your new faith. For all of us today, I want to pray a final blessing over us and ask that God would give us wisdom to be light for him. Father, we're grateful that you've given us the opportunity to live where we live, to be citizens of your kingdom, but also residents of America and citizens here as well. And Father, we ask that you would help us, Lord, to use the platform that you've given us to shine your light in these practical ways, Lord, that others might see and they might glorify you. But God, we ask that you would move so powerfully for your people through this church and churches like it all across the country that, Lord, truly revival would come and awakening would sweep through and you, God, would be exalted over all. Lord, that's the prayer of our heart. Help each and every one of us to do our part in living as light for you. We love you so much, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand to our feet and let's sing together.